uh, Hail Chi Sagini Kor, Your Excellency the Apostolic Nuncio, Excellencies, Representatives of your peoples, Madam Executive Secretary, who has visited me earlier, Reverend Sisters and Fathers, dear friends, Sagini Kor, Tafirkin Fulcher of her Fat, Yatsanato Simaki, Agzatai Gobar, Gokruer, Sanam Timplak, or Sanam Down. It is a very great pleasure and great honour for me to welcome uh, such distinguished guests and indeed activists to Oris and Uthron this evening at what is a most critical juncture in the history of our planet. Ever since our ancestors, Homo habilis, emerged over two million years ago, our species, characterised as we are by our, for, by our capacity for cooperation, creation and imagination, has sought to bend the world around us to fashion for ourselves the material basis for our distinct and diverse cultures. In doing so, many of the foundational and fundamental bases of our social lives have been transformed, and these transformations in turn have had ever greater effects on the earth, Tierra Madre. The commencement of the current geological epoch, the Holocene, brought an end to a long period of repeated glaciations that we often call the Ice Age. These new conditions facilitated a radically different human culture, one based on the domestication of animals, the cultivation of the soil, and sometimes more densely pop dense population urban centres. This Neolithic revolution wrote a new relationship between humans and nature. The vast forests of the ancient world were gradually cleared to make way for agricultural production, altering landscapes, habitats and ecologies, ecosystems. Men and women became workers on the land and tillers of the soil, while others lived in urban centred, created by the agricultural surplus this made possible. It led to hierarchical social relations, which were forged to coordinate production and consumption in these societies. These civilizations were powered by the muscle and sinew of humans and their domesticated animals. And for all the sophistication of ancient Mesopotamia, the Fertile Crescent, medieval Ethiopia, or early modern Italy, they were constrained by nature and yet, I suggest, sought a symmetry with it. They were reliant ultimately for energy on plant life and the process of photosynthesis. The discovery of the ability to convert the energy released by the combustion of carbon into mechanical energy broke that constraint and in doing so gave rise to a new relationship between economy, ecology and ethics. One that I suggest rested upon what would come now as we look back at it, upon a narrow and distorted vision of political economy, sustained by an imperialist ideology, one that had a notion of nature as something to be dominated, subjected to, as I was saying, insatiable extraction. I think of Francis Bacon, I lead to you nature and all of her children in bondage for your use, which stands there as a great hubris at the beginning of both colonization and imperialism. That ideology, for it was that, the creation of a philosophical thought that saw nature as something to be subdued, available for insatiable extraction and exploitation, has brought a 4.5 billion year old planet to a point of extreme vulnerability. And this has been achieved by a distortion of the contribution of science and technology. The promise of reason has given way under imperialism and colonization, I would suggest in the second half of the Enlightenment period, to the destruction of the natural world. An accommodating and widespread scholarship has uncritically supported a view of endless growth, often indeed calling it development. The social and economic critiques produced during the Industrial Revolution are well known. Indeed, they remain foundational for many social, economic and political movements today. Yet perhaps less well known outside the United States 
is the 1864 book, Man and Nature, or Physical Geography as Modified by Human Action, authored by the American diplomat George Perkins Marsh. Dismayed by the changes to the landscape of his native New, New England that he had witnessed during his lifetime, and informed by his studies of the ancient cultures of Southern Europe, Marsh wrote that nature was not an inexhaustible resource, but that environmental degradation, soil erosion, and deforestation could bring an end to modern civilization, as it was called, much as it has had to the civilizations of the ancient Mediterranean. Man and Nature was published 150 years ago. There is now, of course, a far greater popular and scientific understanding of the influence that human civilization, so-called, through its actions, exerts upon the planetary biosphere and ecosystem, and indeed upon the potential for this influence to cause environmental calamities no less ruinous than those that befell previous human culture. Dear friends, the Nobel Prize winning atmosphere chemist Paul Crutzen has argued that we should recognize the age in which we now live as a new epoch in world history, the Anthropocene, which is the qualitative change in the relationship between a single species, our own, and the global environment. That term was first proposed by the Italian geologist and priest, Father Antonio Stapani, in 1873. We know all too well the catastrophic effects of anthropogenic climate change and the massive disruptions to the carbon cycle produced by the emission of greenhouse gases and their growing accumulation in the atmosphere. Human activity has also significantly altered the nitrogen, phosphorus and sulphur cycles which are so important to life on this planet. The terrestrial water cycle so vital to agriculture, particularly in areas of rain-fed agriculture such as the Sahel, has been modified by deforestation and disruption to river systems. Many scientists argue that we are now in the midst of the sixth great mass extinction, such as the sudden loss in biodiversity that may occur in this century. A cordial, dear friends, the challenges of living in this age of the Anthropocene cannot be met by our continuing in the grip of old and tired orthodoxies, or by our being constrained by an economic philosophy which would separate our engagement and activity in economic life from our culture and society or from the natural world. Why, I ask, have we made ourselves unable to make the necessary paradigm shift that is required in our capacity for intellectual, moral, indeed spiritual thought. We shall need new ideas, and we must advocate and fight for those ideas, both intellectually and practically, invoking the enduring human values of compassion, solidarity, and friendship that are capable of addressing the gross inequalities of wealth, power, and income, which are deepening, and which so often lie at the heart of the dysfunctional relationship between economic activity and the ecosystem. Donald Kerr was one of the authors of Laudato Si, an Irish response. So the authors came to see me just recently. And in that book, he wrote in his contribution of the fundamental connectedness of our world. I quote, it is because everything in our universe has its origins in the Big Bang, which took place 13,750,000 years ago. The incredible explosion of energy gave rise after a billion years to the formation of 100 million galaxies. The galaxy of which our world exists is called the Milky Way. It contains billions of stars. In our galaxy, about 4.6 million years after the initial Big Bang, exploding stars dissolved into dust. Some of this dust in turn coalesced into other stars, one of which is our own sun. Some of the remaining cosmic dust formed the planets, including planet Earth. In this world, which is our home, there emerged over billions of years the seas, the land and the air. Much later came the water creatures, the plants, the animals, and eventually the various branches of humanity. Every rock, tree, animal, and person all have a common origin. 
all are composed of the same cosmic material, which some people call star stuff, and are all related to each other. I believe that the global community can, in fact, see something of the emerging discourse, can draw inspiration from Pope Francis, who has, through his pontificate, offered words of hope and inspiration in times that when they were dis that are desperately needed. So it is a great honour to be joined by a representative of the Holy See this evening, His Excellency Most Reverend Archbishop of Colo. And so today may I express how much I, as Uktron here, and look forward, of course, to welcoming Pope Francis this August. Last January I had the opportunity, as I have said, to meet all of the contributors to the volume to which I've already made reference, Laudato Si, an Irish response. It is a collection of essays edited by Father Sean McDonough, who of course is a powerful champion of for ecological justice, and it contains the reflections of Irish theologians, academics and environmentalists. I am delighted to say many of them are here this evening. And they were making their reflection on that wonderful second encyclical of Pope Francis, which bears the subtitle, of course, On Care for Our Common Home. Their visit and their book were another reminder of the vital moral intervention that Lord Atto C. represented as a call for both global, social, and environmental justice, and for what it put as a new and universal solidarity in the face of interrelated threats, which constitute nothing less than, as it put it, an ecological crisis. Above all, Pope Francis reminded us that it is only by recognising that pollution, climate change, the loss of biodiversity, desertification, the growing scarcity of fresh water, global social and economic inequalities are all part of a single complex and interconnected system, one that we can and must come to understand and to change. These great global challenges cannot be met alone by any one country or group of countries. They require international cooperation and global solutions. <coughs> so I was very pleased this afternoon to welcome Taurus and Uktron, and I'm glad that we're joined again later than just now by the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, Monique Barbout. The Convention stands with the Convention on Biological Diversity and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change as expressions of practical global solidarity that is required. They represent not only the three great achievements of the Earth Summit of 1992, which I remember attending in, in, in all those years ago, but the, they are the primary vehicles through which we can organise our efforts to confront the threats that face humanity in the Anthropocene. More than any other place on Earth, the continent of Africa is now the crucible for the global challenges that we confront. It is bearing and will continue to bear the greatest consequence of climate change. The United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs has estimated that by 2050, the continent will contain 2.5 billion people, one billion of whom will be young people. By mid-century then, Africa will be the continent of the young, with nearly 40% of the young people on this planet. It promises to be a continent of promise and opportunity, one that will carry so many hope of the hopes and the dreams of our shared planet. And I pause to say, I have described it as the planet of the young and of hope, and that that is so different from seeing it as a source of threat or dysfunction to what is clearly dysfunctional in our present experience. This growing population will require food, water, energy and shelter, and all the intellectual and material resources required to lead a fulfilling life. In Africa, these needs must be met on a continent to which 46% of the land is now affected by land degradation, and where as a result the livelihoods of nearly 65% of the people are jeopardised. 
This is nowhere more critical than in the Sahel, the Sahel region, home to over 100 million people and the area most vulnerable to desertification and the gradual encroachment of the Sahara. By 2050, the Sahel is projected to be home to over 340 million people. Like many of the environmental processes in the Anthropocene, land degradation is man-made. Overgrazing, deforestation, unsustainable agricultural practices. These are all a result of human activities. In many countries in the global north, these are driven by short-term profit, authorised by an inadequate and insufficient economic model. Shareholders who have no idea of the corporation's activities to which, from which they are drawing income. Corporations who have defied the international community for transparency or accountability. In arid dry lands such as the Sahel, people are reliant on a highly variable and intermittent resource base. And so often unsustainable practices are not driven by as is in the global north, green, but by the very necessity to survive itself. When we recalled International Women's Day here the Oris and celebrated with so many others, I mentioned that the burden of survival is borne above all else by rural women. They are the backbone of the agriculture and labour force, and in sub-Saharan Africa, over 60% of all working women are employed in agriculture, often working long hours with no formal contracts or legal protection. And indeed, I have to say, often by some development agents suggested, removing the very title to the land in which they work from under their home. They are often, in addition to the in addition to all of this, to formal work, Women, of course, are carrying on all the household tasks, including the collection of wood and water, often in perilous conditions. In the dry land conditions of the Sahel, this becomes a far more difficult task as resources have dwindled and deforestation becomes more pervasive. We must not despair. The Convention to Combat Desertification, of which you will hear, has shown that land degradation can be combated through new land management practices. I often think of the proposals on pulses, which have, could be applied, equitable land tenure arrangements, reforestation programs. And the nations of the world, including Ireland, have pledged in one of the Sustainable Development Goals to combat desertification, restore degraded land and soil, including land affected by desertification, drought and floods, and to strive to achieve a land degradation neutral world by 2030. And we must turn our words into implementable actions. When I had a meeting with this afternoon with Dr. Baboud, I in fact she mentioned to me that in Niger, five million hectares have been in fact restored at a cost simply of about 25 euro per hectare. Much is achievable. And I think what is being suggested and celebrated this, this afternoon is an ambitious goal, and it has found an initiative equal to its ambition. And this is the audacity, but also the wonderful inspiration that is in the proposed establishment of the Great Green Wall, a zone of land restoration running over almost 8,000 kilometres from Dakar to Djibouti, in its breadth of vision and its promise of uniting African nations behind a single transformative continental enterprise, it is most characteristic of Thomas Sankara, who as president of Burkina Faso in the 1980s did so much to plant the idea in the minds of the continent. Under the leadership of the African Union Commission and the Pan-African Agency of the Great Green Wall, the wall now brings together so many of the nations of Africa in this common endeavour. And indeed I say to the Nazi, Nigeria is involved, and Senegal of course, and so many Africans. Such a great project for uniting African, African ethics. The project now encompasses a range of potentially transformative national and pan-African projects, including reforestation, 
climate adaptation, sustainable soil and water management, support for communities and drylands, capacity building and technology transfer, so crucial. How can morally we justify any refusal to allow science and technology to leap over the artificial fences that have been created and not be available to the continent of Africa? It includes innovative initiatives, including payment to communities for ecosystem services and participatory management plans for forests. With its capacity to unite nations and communities in solidarity, the Great Green Wall represents the very best of the kind of international cooperation that will be required in this century. So I was very pleased when Don Mullen told me that the Society of African Missions is integrating the Great Green Wall into its Laudato Tree project an extension of the wonderful thumbprint campaign for climate justice, which is already bringing the message of climate justice into schools, parishes and communities across Ireland. Indeed, Ireland shares so much with the nations of Africa, a long and unremitting struggle for independence, the challenges of creating a nation state capable of fulfilling the potential and promise of the independent struggle. We share also a contemporary experience of land degradation and sustainability in land use. And I'm sure that Quilcher, the Iron State Forestry Company, can recount the lessons of planting non-native woodland on in inappropriate marginal soils. Indeed, as a former minister, as I was myself, with responsibility for our natural heritage, I saw firsthand the difficulty of persuading people of the importance of biodiversity and of the many services provided by our complex ecosystems, none of which are taken account of often in our present understanding of economics. There is nothing natural about such a dysfunctional ideological version of economics. This shared experience we have, Ireland and Africa, has given rise to a special solidarity, one that has reached its highest expression in the work, indeed, of the Society of African Missions and such bodies as the Missionary Sisters of Our Lady of the Apostles. In Laudato Si, Pope Francis wrote that in the present conditions of global society, where injustices abound and growing numbers of people are deprived of basic human rights and considered expendable, the principle of the common good immediately becomes, logically and inevitably, a summons to solidarity and a preferential option for the poorest of our brothers and sisters. For many years, Irish men and women from the OLA and SMA and other bodies have answered that call. And may I say to them today, who are represented here, that their compassion, hope and courage has indeed been exemplary. Many of you have committed your lives to standing in solidarity with communities across the developing world, so-called, a world that is waiting for its moment. With them you've built schools and clinics, planted trees, you've helped the most vulnerable within societies and stood with them against injustice and oppression. Many of you have lived within communities in the Sahel and in other areas facing similar challenges and have supported them in their efforts to withstand and adapt to the changes that I have been speaking about. I would like to acknowledge the enormous contribution you've made in your careers, in your lives. You have indeed been wonderful ambassadors, not just for Ireland, but for humanity and for your faith. By your actions, you have humbled us, and by your words, you now draw attention. But yet again, you are coming with this in support of this proposal, asking for our attention, the attention of our country to climate justice. It is a message that comes from those who understand so well how the structures we've created at a global level can impact on people who are driven to live a precarious existence. How changing climate patterns and reducing yields due to soil degradation are simply catastrophic. You are well placed to help teachers in Ireland of why this matters to us now and how we must help. I am delighted that we've been joined by representatives from so many of the environmental and development NGOs from voluntary and state organisations who will all have a part to play in Ireland's response to the interlinked global challenges we now face. It is heartening to hear of new partnerships that are now emerging 
between the United Nations, our government, faith-based organisations, state bodies, civil society. To effectively address the enormous challenges we face, this simply must be the way of the future. And I put it to you, as President of Ireland, how do we want to be seen from abroad, giving a lead in matters like this, which a country like us, given our population size, given our hair record, can do so well? Or simply to be people who in fact actually recoiled in the politics of fear and just resigned ourselves to the military expression of our identity. We are one global family. We must recognise that the problems faced by a farmer in Niger are our problems, that the struggles of women in Mali to live decently are our struggles, that the hunger of a child in the Sudan is our hunger, and that we owe to each other an imprescriptible ethical duty to act to overturn injustice and put in place an economic and social order. And I say this again, it isn't that we are asking to simply make changes. I say the economics of which I've been speaking, when it is connected to ecology and ethics, is simply better economics. And the economics that is destructive is simply intellectually and scholarly poor economics, narrow and insufficient and manifestly dysfunctional. I think what we need to put in place then is something that can meet the needs of all of our peoples without imperiling the natural systems on which we all ultimately depend. Tierra Madre. I finish by saying this. Some years ago in 2004, 14 years ago, I was thinking the very same thoughts, rather similar to those of the words of Donald Dorr that I have quoted from his contribution to allow that to see an Irish response. I often feel that it tells something, I think, about the insufficiency of our intellectual work, that in fact, actually, those who are writing and thinking with poetic instinct might be able to touch as those interested in spirituality can do the essence of the problem. I, may I finish with a poem I wrote in 2004? It's Stardust from my collection, An Arid Season. It is of stardust we are, moulded by vapours and fragments, from the making and breaking of galaxies. We are the broken bits of our cosmos, moved by traces of embedded memory, of hopes unrealised and fading. The promise of our as yet uncreated wholeness remains, however weak. That echoes of lost prophecy, deep within we hear it call, offering more than a refuge, making a fresh story of a new time and wondrous space. A promise of the as yet uncreated joy made out of stardust. Gremila Market, thank you.